And welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Again, my name is Mike Jokum. With me, I have my trusty co-host, Jess Baker. And our first driver guest of 2018 is none other than the 2017 Verizon IndyCar Series champion, Joseph Newgarden. Joseph, thank you so much for joining the show today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's great to be on. Uh, thanks for, for letting me join you guys today. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know, it's pretty cool when you can say your your first guest... Uh, you know that is a driver is the is the 2017 champion. Uh, how has the off season been? Do you get any Do you get any rest, or has it been you know constant, uh, yeah, you know, meetings and and trips and and appearances? You know, it's really been uh, an adjustment for me the last year, just because um, you know joining Team Penske last off season um, was a real shift. You know, I was used to. I was used to being busy. I was definitely busy at Ed Carpenter Racing and uh, the teams before that. But uh, when you join Team Penske, there's there's so many partnerships and, and uh, relationships that you really got to be up to speed on and really helping the team work on that. You're kind of all over the place. So uh, you have that element that you're dealing with. And then, and then certainly with the championship and us being able to, sh- to secure that last year, that, that really brought everything up a notch, too. And we've been busy with um, a lot of stuff from from that side. So. Yeah, we're too, I'm always traveling. You know, I'm always trying to explain what I'm doing. I'm normally at conferences or, you know, speaking at an event or, or meeting with one of our partners. Uh, that's that's normally what I do when I'm on the road. But there's uh, there's some fun stuff that gets sprinkled into. Like I got to go to Nashville a couple weeks back and uh, watch Predators game. Uh, see my friends at Firestone. So stuff like that. So you get get kind of stuff all over the place. But um, it's busy. It is it's busy. And then you know we're trying to fit in this the work for the new season too. So I'm trying to get to the shop and work with the engineers and make sure that we're going to be ready to go for, for 2018. Yeah. The, uh, predators game thing looked pretty awesome as, as a big hockey fan myself. I've, you know, been to Nashville a handful of times, walked by the Bridgestone building, but, uh, that looked real cool. Um, yeah, Jess, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So Joseph, if you have not listened, I'm kind of the, uh, the one who does the comic relief. So my questions are not going to be anything related to racing whatsoever. You're the fun one then. Yes, I am the fun one. So my first question for you is, what is your spirit animal? Oh, my spirit. That's a great question. Uh, my, my spirit animal. I'm pretty sure I've answered this multiple times before, <laughs> but I don't, I don't remember what I said last time. Um, if I was going to have a spirit animal... I mean, I'd want to be something. I'm pretty sure I told someone I wanted to be like a, like a velociraptor one time, <laughs> okay, and that's okay. you know that I don't even know if that counts, but you know we've got Jurassic Park coming back in strong in the movie game, so I'm I'm gonna go with like a velociraptor. I like it. Just great, great question to start off here. Uh, all right, well, <laughs> since I'm the I'm the non-fun one, I'll stick with the racing questions. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of getting to the shop to, you know, get the 2018 car ready. And I've seen a little bit about what you said online, but, you know, is, is there any data from the last couple of years in the, in the arrow kit era that you can bring into this new universal arrow kit or are you guys, you know, mainly starting from scratch? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're really, it's really going to depend. So whenever I talk about the, the new universal kit, it, it really what I tell people is it depends on the track that we're going to go to next year. So, you know, if you're talking street courses, I think they're going to change drastically. I don't think we're going to be able to rely on too much from what we've had from a setup standpoint in the past. Um, and then as you go into road courses, it's really going to be a mixed bag. If you go to a, a low downforce road course like a Road America, I think a lot of what we've done last year will still apply um, because the the actual arrow numbers are not that different on a, on a low downforce track but but a high downforce track you know you're you're looking at a place like mid ohio or or barber motorsports park or sonoma those places will change quite a bit you know there's there's less arrow that we can produce on the car from a downforce standpoint and so that 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 will change a lot and then as you get into the ovals it's it's mixed again there too the short ovals i think are going to be completely different you're going to need totally new setups you're going to be braking now in the corners uh you know definitely as the tires wear out you're going to be braking um, but on, on a, you know, a high speed, um, a high speed oval, the speedways like yeah, Indianapolis Motor Speedway or, or Pocono or Texas, I, I, I think you, you're not going to you're not going to change that much. So the, those great races that we've had, like at the Indy 500 over the last five, six years, I think you'll still have those. And 
And a lot of the setups will actually still still work and apply like they have in years past. So, you know, this is just me talking before we've even gone through the year. But I think it's really going to depend. I think some some stuff will work, some stuff won't. Um, and it's going to be our job to figure out, you know, what those pieces are or aren't. Sure. Sure. No. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Jess, go go ahead. <laughs> so, Joseph, what is your 90s jam song? Oh, oh my 90s jam song? Uh, I'm more of an 80s guy. Like, if okay, you ask me so the 80s, 80s jam song. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I need to, like, see, I'm really bad at remembering stuff. So, I have... I have like tons of compilations on my like eighties playlists. Um, I'm almost trying to stall so I can look this up in my phone because <laughs> I don't have I don't have one particular song, but I have I'm telling you, I have this like total love for for eighties music. So I don't know, like some old school Elton John or something like that or you know Please know. tell me you wear the sunglasses when you're jamming to Elton John. I, I I don't, but I look I look ridiculous in my car. When I'm singing it. <laughs> so, yeah, I like I like weird stuff. Like I like Phil Collins. Like I don't even know if oh, that's yeah. okay to like Phil Collins, but I I love that type of music. Listen, I grew up listening to Phil Collins before I was old enough to discover my own music, so uh, I I can't knock that one. Right, <laughs> dude, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Like in the air tonight, I would I'll rock the heck out of that song. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was on my YouTube this morning as, as I got my day started here. So, uh, yeah, I, I certainly understand. Hey, so going back to, you know, the new car, when, when you guys test at, at Phoenix uh, in a couple weeks here, I know that was one of the, you know, short ovals that could, you know, drastically change. Will will you guys run in traffic to kind of get a feel for how the race is going to be, or or do you think guys will be a little bit more conservative and just kind of get a shakedown of the car? No, I think you'll see a lot of people running in traffic. You know, what, normally what we've had happen is that the morning time uh, will generally you know work on qualifying stuff. I think when we first get there, everyone's going to just try and find their footing and understand what the car's doing. You know, make sure that they're comfortable with the car before they, they get in traffic. That's normally more difficult to do. You really want to be, you know, confident and comfortable in where the car is at and underneath you. So the morning time or I think it's early afternoon, uh, we'll, we'll mostly work on that stuff. But then as we get to like the evening sessions, you'll definitely see people running with each other a lot just because we, we have to figure that out before the race. You know, we have to run together, see what the car is like, see what it's going to need. Um, so I think you'll just see for both days, you'll see split mentalities where, you know, the early afternoon we're working on qualifying, qualifying stuff. And then at the nighttime, we'll probably work on, on racing stuff. Sure. Jess. All right. So you are stuck on a deserted Island. <laughs> oh, no. What is one item that you would like to have? Um, well, I mean, for me, I think food is critical. So I, you know, you're not a know. hunter scavenger. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could, you know, I need, I need like a, I need to have like a spear. I think I, if someone gave me a spear, <laughs> I don't know if I could create one on the island. So I would need a spear to go fishing because uh, I love seafood. So yeah, I would probably ask for a spear or some sort of object to kill things with. All right. I can't, can't knock that one. No, not at all. Because I don't know if I could build a spear either. <laughs> uh, I think I think maybe uh, in in the Poconos we'll have to uh, you know go into the woods there and and, and find, try it <laughs> find a spear to hunt with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not I've not had a ton of experience. I you know you got to know like what is this island really supplying you with? Like you you almost want to know the background on the island before you can commit to an item because I mean like maybe it has materials to build a spear. If it does, then I want to change my answer. You know, you just never know. That's true. You don't. That is the best answer to that question I think I have ever heard in all of the years you've you've heard people be asked that question anywhere. Um, switching gears, you know, going back to you know your Indy Lights run in 2011, how important is Indy Lights and the Mazda Road to Indy to a driver's overall development? And do you think it does it give any sort of advantage over? Maybe a guy coming over from you know F two or or F three or any of these European series. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it helps a lot, you know, to, particularly when you get to the Indy Lights level. You know, so say you trained in Europe on the, the lower ranks and then you're ready to get to like the Indy Lights level. You know, I think when you come over here and run that championship, it's really beneficial um, to getting into IndyCar. You know, just because of the obvious things. I mean, you're, you're going to be running on the same tracks. Um, IndyCar is very diverse. You know, you, you've really got to get into the mentality of switching back and forth between Road Street and, and Oval Tracks. It's 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 harder than it, it looks. I mean, you really got to understand how to flow throughout the year with your driving style, your your setup preferences. It's They're very, very different. So you're not going to get that in Europe where you can just bounce back and forth between these very different racetracks and I think Indy Lights, it just it provides that opportunity and kind of um, culture where you can learn about that. And so you, know, you can't replace that. I think it's, it's tremendously beneficial. I think guys that go through that type of program have an easier time transitioning into IndyCar. It's not that you can't come straight to IndyCar. I just think you're going to have a quicker transition. So there's there's definitely positives to trying to go up through the, the road to Indy route than, than just coming over from Europe. Sure. Yeah, and I know even, uh, you yeah. know, for those out there that don't know, Joseph even lapped the entire field at New Hampshire Speedway towards the end of the season, <laughs> which I think has either never been replicated or was only replicated one other time, depending on what website you look at. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I forgot about that, but that did, I guess that did happen. But I, I'm sure it's been done before. You know, it just depends on the race and how many people are in the field and stuff like that. Yeah, some some of the uh Indy Lights records are a little a little tougher to find uh you know scrolling through the internet. Uh but Jess, I'll I'll turn it back over to you. All right. So Joseph switching gears a little bit, not quite as uh funny, I guess, but if you could go back and be born as any person in any time in history, wow. Who would you pick and why? These are great questions. I, you know, I wish I could think about these because they're they're awesome <laughs> questions. But you need like some I like time to, to reflect. <laughs> it's it's they're great. Like these are really thought provoking questions. Um, anybody? Oh my gosh! At any time. I mean, you know, I I wouldn't mind going back as like Abraham Lincoln and like getting you know and being born in his time frame just to see the world in that era. I mean, that would be fascinating. But then again, you know, it would be so neat to go back as like, I don't know, Julius Caesar and like see the world at, at that time with the, the Roman Empire and everything. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of time periods you could go see. I would say probably one of those two would be my preferred ones. I think if I had to pick out of those two, I'd probably go with Caesar because that would be pretty cool to go back and, and see what it was like when Rome was at its height. You know what you know, What else would be good is I'd love to go back to like the 40s or 50s, like the late 40s, early 50s. Like I really think everything was just – it was just a great time in the world because, you know, technology was – it was evolving, but it wasn't at a point to where it was like super uh, invasive in your life. So, you know, it was just – it just seemed like such a happy time to be alive, especially in America. So I'd, I'd probably say like the early 50s too. Ooh, yeah, yeah that would be long. cool. Especially with how different – you know, racing was back then with multiple chassis and you know, 65 people trying to get in the Indy 500. Uh, you know, I've heard, yeah. the, heard the stories about it from, you know, my dad and my grandpa, but, uh, you know, to be able to witness that or, you know, even more locally, Trenton Speedway or Langhorne Speedway, uh, which are now just, you know, shopping centers, but, uh, yeah. you know, it would be really cool to see. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I'd love to see that too. What are your thoughts? You know, I know IndyCar... And, you know, Jay Fry have, have done an amazing job uh, on, on the oval qualifying, uh, you know, slight tweaks. I saw many drivers come out and say how great it was. Uh, curious is if you agree, disagree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was I was one of the, the people uh, pushing Jay <laughs> aggressively to, to make that change. Um, and I think Jay, you know, J Jay gets it better than anybody. You know, he, he wanted it, too. So, you know, for us on the driving side, we just didn't want a lottery system to really dictate where you're going to qualify. Um, you know, it's it's the the old procedure was basically pulling a, you know, pulling a, a piece of paper out of a hat and seeing what number you were. And it's just, you know, it was kind of hokey. Like I, it's not it's been done in racing, but we just thought there, there should be some performance behind where you qualify and you know that's really really important on short ovals because if you go first on a short oval you're getting 
crazy penalized. It's very, very difficult to qualify and pull when you go out first. And then it's kind of the same story on the, the indie qualifying points. You know, it was just, it was almost too much of a reward for, you're basically giving someone a race worth of points um, when the field's going to be quite a bit larger and people that are in the championship are in it. So we just didn't see, we didn't see that as something that was fair. Um, and people are still going to go for it. They're still going to try and get the pole just because it's, it's the Indianapolis 500 and, and that's never going to change. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree about the 500. I thought it was ironic that, you know, thankfully he was okay, but Scott Dixon finishing in 33rd or 32nd place, ending up with more points than uh, somebody who finished up in, in, in 10th place because of how yeah. he qualified. Uh, mm-hmm. So I found that pretty interesting, but I will, uh, I'll turn it over to Jess here. All right, Joseph, you get one superpower. What do you Ooh. pick and why? Um, for me, it would be uh, teleportation. I just want to be able to teleport wherever in the world at, at yeah, any that would be, given time. That would be nice. I mean, Did you ever you see know. that movie? Uh, I think it was uh, Jumper, or it yes. wasn't. I think it was Jumper. It wasn't Looper. I think Looper was the the a different concept. But there's this. I think it was Jumper, and the guy could like just literally teleport wherever at any given moment if he'd had been in that location before. And I just thought, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. It'd be the, the greatest superpower in the world. You are correct. It is the movie Jumper. Perfect. Good. I, I thought I remember that correctly. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't remember. All right. Yeah, I like that. I would, uh, I would definitely do quite a bit more traveling if I could teleport. It'd definitely save, it'd be easier save yeah, save, sure. save me some airfare costs too mm-hmm. exactly <laughs> hey so you know obviously 2017 is is a career year and and one to remember but but if you had to pick out one moment outside from winning the championship whether it be you know the pass at gateway for the win late in the race or you know winning another race or even something else what is that one moment that you'll look back on years from now and go that was a hell of a year. Well, I really enjoyed 2008 because um, I got I got the opportunity to go over and race in the form of the Ford Festival in in England. And you know, if if you're into you're into European racing, then you most people know about the form of the Ford Festival, and it's 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 always been such a big event. And you know, guys like Michael Schumacher, Ayrton Senna, like that—that that was the event that they would they would go and run. And it was like it was a big deal if you won that race. Sure. And there's not been a ton of Americans that have competed in it. There's some, um, but there's there's certainly been no American winner before. And so when we went over in 2008, at the end of the year, um, I was lucky enough to win the race. So it was just I, I I thought that was so cool. They were very nice to us over there. It was the first time I'd been out of the country racing and. It was just, it was a really big deal. I, I mean, to me personally, I thought it was, I thought it was so much fun and, and, um, you know, it was a big achievement to be able to go and run with those guys and first time over in a different country win that type of race. So I, I just enjoyed that. I thought it was a, you know, a good springboard for me to go compete over there for a couple of years. And it was, it was a super fun time in my life, um, you know, with, with racing. Sure. Jess. Okay. So you are throwing a dinner party now. Ooh. And you get to invite three people uh, from history, dead or alive. Okay. Who would you pick? From history, you mean like, so they got to be historical or it's just like, it doesn't matter any time frame. It could be any people. It, it doesn't matter. It could be any time frame. Mm, okay. Well, I'd probably pick, you know, I'm really into like cinematography and movie, movie production. So I'd probably pick like, Christopher Nolan, who's my favorite director, I someone like Ron Howard, like I'd invite him too. And then I don't know, I'd I'd pick like an actor, like the uh, or I could bring Scorsese too. There you go. Then you got like three <laughs> great movie makers. So I'd bring like yeah, I I bring those guys. Scorsese would be the third. That's awesome. That that's telling. You definitely gave away a hobby there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm into it. I just th- I think it's fun. I enjoy the work that people do. Um, you know when they make uh, great pieces and 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 good movie making. So I've I've always been a fan of that industry. Has there been? Yeah, it's a- oh, I'm sorry, Jess. Go ahead. I was going to say it's amazing how it, uh, a good movie just takes you away, takes you completely out of reality. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea of it too. You know, I think for a lot of those guys, they want to, you know, kind of transport you for a couple hours in your life, and 
and make you feel like you're somewhere else in you know a different time or a different setting. Yeah, it's great. Has there been a if you've had a, a free moment, a movie in the last year that you've seen that's kind of your uh, your your favorite? Oh, you know, it's the same for this. I've seen a lot of new movies. Um, American Made was pretty cool. Uh, new Tom Tom Cruise movie um, is really well made. It was it was you know an interesting story. It's based on a true story too about this pilot that was working with like the CIA um, and also the the drug cartel down in South America. And it's just super interesting the way they made and told that story. So I, I liked that. Uh, I liked Dunkirk because it was different for Christopher Nolan. Um, I, he hadn't done like a war type movie before. So I, I enjoyed that. So yeah, I would say those, those are two of the recent ones I've seen. Cool. Um, so going back to 2017, probably you know, my personal favorite race of the year uh, in, in Pocono, your, your power with your, your, your battle with willpower, you know, the last 20 laps of the race, it, it was tough to see going into, uh, you know, the, the, the long turn three, how close were you to being able to, to pass him or how, you know, how, how intense was that battle for the last, I think it was 15 or 20 laps of the race. Yeah. You know, it was intense. I mean, I was, I was certainly trying to get by will, but I just did not have the speed that he had. Um, and it was, it was more difficult than it looked. You know, I, people saw me getting really, really close as we approached turn two. And then, you know, I would try and pop out, especially to the, to the, to the outside because will was constantly protecting the inside, um, which was fine. I just, I just did not have enough speed. Like, you know, every time I popped out on him on the outside, it was not enough to fully clear him before turn three. So if you can't do that, then you're putting yourself in a very difficult position. I'd have to, I'd have to really force the issue in turn three to pass him. And I thought it was too much risk um, at that time. And, you know, to me, Will had the faster car. So, you know, trying to maintain where we were and not let Alex get more into the mix, that was really what I was trying to do. If I, if I could get Will, I was going to do it. But with the way he was protecting, I would have had to force the issue too much into turn three. And I, I, didn't think the risk was worth it with, you know, where we were sitting as a team standpoint in that race. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was definitely since you guys have been back at Pocono, I think the you know best race overall. But that that battle there at the end is is one uh, you know everybody is is still talking about. It was you know six months ago. Um, <laughs> Jess. Okay, so. Kind of want to know: Are you a handyman? What was the last thing that you had to fix? Um, yeah, a little bit. You know, I still I get quite a bit of help around my my place. I just got a place last year. I got a townhouse now. It was the first place that I've owned. Um, and I, you know, I'm pretty good with electronics. Like, if there's anything that I got to sort out with TVs or speakers or stereo systems or something like that, I can normally figure it out and get it going. Um, but you know, like carpentry work, I haven't done, I have not done much carpentry work in the last year. So I normally, I normally get someone that's much better at it than me to, to sort it out. Um, you know, I could just fix little stuff like, you know, if like a light's broken in the ceiling, like I can fix it or, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what I've done recently. I've, I've done some stuff in the garage. Like I had to, I had to put some shelves up. So I've done that, but that's you know pretty much the extent of, of what I'm doing. I don't know my I hire some some pros that are way better at me yet uh, than this type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I I am the worst handyman on on the face of the earth to the point where you know we we, we just moved into a house uh, a couple months ago and and my wife does all the IKEA building or furniture putting together and uh, I sit in the other room and do the technical stuff. <laughs> yeah see the tough for me is like i could probably do most anything like I, I think i could figure it out but i just get so particular that you know i know if i'm not going to do something well then i don't want to do it like i'd rather have someone that that can do it really well that i know is way better at me at it than i'd, I'd want them to come do it so I, that's why i don't i don't venture too far like i'll build furniture like if i gotta move stuff it's fine like you know any little things but you're talking about like building something out in in like if you wanted a pantry and you wanted it built out like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do that because i know if i do it it's it's gonna be mediocre to, to subpar 
hey, yeah. at least you're honest about it and you don't you don't try. <laughs> I uh, I did the same thing when I owned a house. If I needed something major done, I just called in the professional. It was way easier and I wanted it done right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the great thing about technology is you can log on to something like Facebook and go to your, your town's Facebook group and go, who can help me with this stuff? Because uh, I, I know I won't be able to change out a ceiling fan downstairs, but the, I can pay somebody to do it and I won't get yelled at for doing yeah. that. Or electrocuted. Or electrocuted, <laughs> yes. It's true. It's true of technology. You know, there's there's one of the, the benefits of it. So what do you think of, you know, how great is it that we have, you know, four new IndyCar teams this year? You know, we have Carlin and Harding full-time, and then Michael Shank and, and Junkos, uh, you know, part-time, but, you know, running a, a good bulk of the schedule. Do you do you think there are going to be more teams to potentially come, and, and how, uh, how wary should the field be of uh, Trevor Carlin? Oh, I think it should be very wary of, of Carlin in particular. You know, I think they'll be a, a very strong team, uh, a very legitimate team. Like they're, you know, they're going to give everyone a run for the money once they find their footing, and they kind of understand how everything works. Um, you know, they're going to need a little bit of initiation time, but I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't take much. You know, they they, they should be, you know, able to to get going pretty fast. Um, you know, so yeah, that's that's Carlin. And then you think about the other groups. The nice thing is I think they're all prepared to grow with the series. So it's not like, you know, they're just coming in for a little bit of time and then they're going to go away. I think they all seem like very serious team owners that want to be a part of the series for the future. So if you have four new owners, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a lot of team owners that are coming in that are committing to the series and, and committing to figuring it out. So uh, I'm excited about all of them. But but for sure, the Carlin organization, they're going to be a serious threat, I think, within you know a couple of years. Yeah, I know. Uh, almost half the field, if not more than half the field, has even raced for Carlin in some venture at some point in their racing careers, which is is a pretty amazing stat. Yeah, yeah, they've you know they've really had a lot of the the top line drivers in the world compete for them. You know, mainly in Europe, Formula Three was kind of their big thing um, ten years ago, and they they've been the best at that in in British Formula Three, and so they've seen most of the guys come through that, but. You know, they branched out. They started doing uh, Formula Renault 3.5, and they had a lot of guys come through that. And then, obviously, they do GP, GP2, GP3 now. So they, they have a lot of programs, um, and they've just had a lot of good guys, both on the IndyCar and Formula 1 side, that have, have been through their organization. So they're they're the real deal. If you're talking about a, a junior team, it's, it's, it's very much like a Sam Schmidt-type operation. You know, the, the Schmidt-Peterson team. Sam Schmidt really, he just had his lights program, and then you can see what he's done in IndyCar now. You know, he's, he's a legitimate organization, and I think you'll see the, the same sort of deal with, with Carlin very soon. Jess? All right, so this is kind of a random one, but what villain do you feel bad for? <laughs> oh, what villain do I feel bad for? Um, hmm, I don't know that I, you know, I, I don't have anyone off the top of my head. Like if I, yeah, I don't have anyone that I like truly feel bad for right now, but I'm sure there's someone like if I watch something, I'll be like, you know, he's probably getting a, he's probably getting the rough end of something right now that he doesn't deserve, but I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. Jess, do you have an answer to that one? I'm, I'm with Joseph. I have, I have no idea off the top of my head on that one. I mean, it's not like a villain villain per se because he ends up turning into a good guy but like the beast from beauty and the beast because at oh, first yeah. he's kind of a villain you know and you gotta kind of feel bad for him yeah that well that's a that's a good one yeah i mean <laughs> i think once you see his good side so i guess he yeah he's a villain i didn't think about that yeah i would say well disney's so good at making their villains lovable so <laughs> aren't they i you love know. disney yeah, they rock. I'm a big. I'm a big Disney fan as well. But it, yeah, I, w- I would agree with you. I think the Beast. That's a good choice. I was thinking of like. I think you meant like a true villain that's like never turns good, but you kind of kind of like him. I, I don't. I don't know anyone then. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. But you know, the the question's open. So. I, I guess I would go. You know, this isn't Disney related or a movie, but from a TV show. Uh, you know. Omar from The Wire is, is is pretty much a villain, but in the end, when he, uh, you know, spoiler alert, gets shot and killed, uh, 
I, I you you do feel bad for him. Uh, and if either of you guys haven't watched that show, I highly recommend it on uh, on some flights or some downtime. Yeah, I haven't, and I've heard it's like the greatest show ever. So that's a good point. I need to I need to I need to watch that at some point. Yeah, you know. I, I get in trouble because I watch it once a year, the entire series. Um, it's, really? It's it's that good, and uh, I only started watching it because my mom bought me season five for Christmas in college, and I went, I'm not going to start with season five. I'm going to start from the, the beginning. You you watch you watch the entire thing over every year. Once a year, usually. Uh, I think we're coming up on that time of year. Usually, you know, February, March, I start it, and uh i i get through it by you know before the summer and and i repeat it every year that is so it must be good <laughs> yeah. i mean that's got to be a damn good show if every year you're like committing to to re-watching it that's oh, amazing yeah i've i've read the wire blogs and stuff that authors have written to find you know little easter eggs in the show and you know various foreshadowing clues and uh, i am i am fully bought into understanding every aspect of that show and uh <laughs> that is amazing i've never heard that but i i love that i I've, I've heard it's good so i'm gonna i'm gonna watch it at some point yeah the wire and uh you know the office because i went to college in scranton and uh parks and rec are, are shows that i have uh you know rewatched watch yearly especially the office because it's such a good comedy yeah, that that one I totally agree on. The Office like is an easy one to to binge like at any point. And I, I like seeing you know very hearing various names in the show and or seeing landmarks and went yeah I used to walk by by there every day when I went to class. Um, oh yeah, so that's it, too funny. It's got it's got a cool personal touch and uh, you know. Anyway, back to uh, you know a racing question here, and I'm not sure if if you know the answer, but I saw yesterday or, or the day before. Hitachi signing on to you know be your uh, primary sponsor for eight races. Do you know you know primary sponsorship for the other? Uh, I guess it's ten total races. Is it you know primarily the same as as the past season? Uh, good question. Yeah, you know I don't know. Um, I'm not sure 100. percent I don't think we've announced what what we're going to do on the other races yet. So I'm going to leave that to the team um, and make sure I don't get in trouble. But I think we've got something <laughs> sorted out. You know Penske's. They're, they're normally pretty good at, at making sure we're all covered. And I, I know we're going to be sorted out on that car. So we just have to wait and see. You know, hopefully we announce something soon. Yeah, sure. Jess? Okay. Man, I've got the most random questions. But anyways, what would be the funnest thing that you can think of to fill a pinata with? Wow. Oh, man. Um, uh, it can be anything. It can be anything. Man, I'd like fill it with like sweet tart ropes or something like that. <laughs> I just, I'm a sucker for sweet tart ropes. Uh, or popcorn, like a great popcorn would be cool. You know, I don't, I don't think anyone's thought about that. No, uh, that's a good one. Mm -mm, yeah, no, I wouldn't have thought of that one. What else? You know, I don't know. You could fill it with like yeah, cookies. <laughs> cookies would be fun. I'd be all about some cookies. You know, you need to be gentle on them so you don't crush them up too much but yeah, yeah that would cookies? be kind of you'd have you'd have cookie crumbs probably <laughs> probably <laughs> what if you like filled it with something weird like subway sandwiches like that would be that would be an odd thing to fill a pinata with i don't know that it'd be mo the most fun thing but it'd be strange <laughs> it's, it's funny as <laughs> it'd be a big pinata <laughs> yeah to, to bring out the the philly boy in me i was going to say a philly cheesesteak but that might get kind of messy yeah, well, oh, I'm yeah. thinking about, you know, they're wrapped. I would say they're wrapped. Okay, okay. You know, you're you're yeah. getting, like, firehouse subs or something like that. They're, like, all wrapped up still. <laughs> oh. Um, all right, let me see here. What race, you know, going into 2018 with the new Arrow Kit, are you, you know, most excited for in general? Outside of the Indy 500. Um, I, you know, I... I I'm always a fan of Road America, so I'm I'm excited to go back there, and I think you know I think we have a good car around there, and and it was a, it was a great race. Like for me, that was a very fun race to be a part of was was Road America. So that's at the top of my list. Um, but everywhere, you know, it's it, everyone asks me what's my favorite track, and it, it's hard to it's hard to have an answer just because we go to so many different types of tracks, and they're they're all pretty unique and and different, and they're all fun in their own way. 
So, you know, next year is going to be a real challenge. I mean, everywhere is going to be a new, you're going to get out a new notebook and, you know, rewrite notes for everywhere you go. So uh, there's, there's not many places I'm not excited for, but, but Road America is always at the top of my list. I, I was thinking back to one of my earlier questions about, you know, setups from the, the previous Arrow Kit era. Will you pull out or will the teams pull out any notes from, you know, the pre Arrow Kit era, you know, the beginning of the DW12, maybe 2011, 2012, uh, you know, to kind of get some ideas or, or is that probably not going to happen? Yeah, good question. Yeah, we, we most likely will. We'll pull out some notes and, and, sort of look at what the car was like some of it's applicable some of it's not but it's it's good to refresh your memory and, and kind of see what the car was like in that era so yeah to answer your question yes we, we do do that and i'm sure a lot of teams um will be looking at their notes from from that era jess okay so now you have a very large block of cheddar cheese weighs about 400 pounds what are you going to do with it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a, four, a, a block of cheddar cheese that's 400 pounds? What am I going to do with it? Yeah, I what mean, are you going to do with it? I'd probably like I'd probably make a party and say, hey, I got a cheese party going on, and everyone needs to come <laughs> help me eat this cheese. I'm thinking, like, put it in a pool and melt it and make, like, the biggest thing of queso ever for a party. I mean. You better okay. make sure that pool does not have chlorine in it. <laughs> well, no, 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 no water in the pool. Empty pool, oh, empty okay, pool, okay. Okay. and then that you just you just put the cheese in there and melt it. Because I can't think of anything that could handle four hundred pounds of cheese other than a pool. I mean, that's a big that's a big chunk of cheese. That's that's a lot of che- you're gonna need a lot of help to eat that cheese. <laughs> I mean, you gotta have a cheese party. I don't know. I don't know how else you handle it other than I, that. I think we. Found I do a, like it. Yeah. I think we found the title <laughs> to today's episode: Cheese Party. The Joseph's. Cheese Party. <laughs> There you go. That's right. That's that's a, that's a, that's a good movie title. Uh, <laughs> so, Jess, I'll turn it over to you again. All right. So, wrapping up because we have kept you for quite a while. What is the most random fact that you know without having to like Google it? <laughs> Gosh, these are all I, I, I don't have straight up answers for any of these things. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Elephants never forget. You got to You got to know that, guys. That's so true. Uh, I, yeah. Anything else? I don't I don't know. I don't I don't have any random. I don't have any random facts. This is this is a great question. I love people that have answers for these immediately. They're just like, <laughs> oh, hey, yeah, this. did you know, like beluga whales uh, reproduce four times a year? Like people will stay stay like. There's people you can meet when you ask them that question, and they'll have the most absurd facts, and they're just ready to go. I, I'm not that person. I, I, I don't, <laughs> but I know people that are like that, and it's really funny. So, listen, before we uh, you know, wrap it up here with one final uh, easy question, your uh, pick for the Super Bowl match and who's going to win the Super Bowl? Oh, great, great, uh, great question again. Um, well, I think the Patriots are going to be in it. That's no doubt. <laughs> they will be there. And I think they'll probably win it, to be honest with you. Um, who are they going to match up against? I don't know. Who do you think they're going to – who do you, you think is going to make it there? So, uh, listen, the, the, the Eagles fan in me is obviously going to say the Eagles. Um, but I think it's – I think the, the NFC uh, championship game is going to be – you know, one of the better or if not best games of, uh, you know, the 2018 playoffs here. Both teams have, uh, you know, an interesting story at quarterback and, and, and great defenses. So, uh, yeah, I hope the Eagles win, but, you know, I, I could see it going either way. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of already bummed because my Titans got knocked out, which was, you know, expected. I figured they were going to get crushed, and they did. <laughs> So I'm kind of, you know, I don't even mind at this point. I just want to see a good game. Um, you know, th- that's what I look forward to now is, is just seeing a good game on, on yep. the uh, Super Bowl. Yeah, no, for sure. So listen, we won't we won't hold you up any any longer here. You've uh, you know been an amazing guest for for the last forty minutes or so. So listen again, yeah, you know, thank you very much. Uh, you know, 
hope you enjoyed being on the show and you know best of luck going into 2018 and uh you know we'll we'll both see it out at the track at some point hey i enjoyed this a lot thank you guys it's good to meet you over the phone yes you too thanks a lot thank you see you now all right bye and thank you again to Joseph Newgarden for joining us here. Uh, you know, it's pretty awesome that he spent so much of the episode with us. Um, you know, really goes to show what an ambassador for, uh, you know, the future of IndyCar he is. And uh, I think, uh, you know, Jay Fry and team have definitely recognized that. You've seen him do, uh, you know, quite a bit of press here this offseason at the Predators game, as he mentioned, and uh, the Detroit Auto Show yesterday, and I'm pretty sure he's also going to be at the St. Louis Auto Show near Gateway next weekend. Don't hold me to that date, but I'm pretty sure it's coming up. Um, so we're going to you know, wrap up the episode here. We're, we're going to make this episode about you know, Mr. Newgarden. But I did want to mention um, for the second straight week, I have won the Poll of the Week Award. Again, Gag. The, Gag. The... the <laughs> The poll results for uh, you know maybe those who uh, neglected to vote or or don't remember what they voted for was uh, you know our pick to win the uh, our, our early and an uneducated guest to win the Indy 500. I had Carlos Minos. Jess went with Tony Kanaan, and guest Matt Hickey last week um, had uh, Helio Castro Neves. And out of the 49 or 50 people who voted, 41% agreed with me, 38% agreed with Matt, and Jess came in last place with a sad 21%. Cue the little sad uh, violin sort of instrument, but I don't have a soundboard with me here. So, Jess, um, I'm going to give you a reprieve, and this week's new poll isn't going to be a competition, but... uh, No, because these are all mine. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, this is true. I win no matter what. Jess Jess is going to win this week's poll. Um, We're going to have some fun with this one and and make it part of our uh, first Pit Lane Parlay uh, t-shirt design. For those who have now listened to the entire episode, we had some fun questions mixed in there with the racing... um, you know, racing questions, which to me really shows that, you know, Joseph is, is one of the, the greatest guys to lead IndyCar into this future because he can talk racing, but if you want to talk about what you would do with a 400-pound block of cheese, uh, he has fun with that. And I think that's, uh, you know, the kind of the personality that, that IndyCar needs to, you know, be in the news um, going forward. So with that, I will... Uh, give you guys the three options for the t-shirt design poll. I'll leave it open for seven days and we'll announce the results and uh, a a t-shirt picture next week. Our three options are cheese party at Joseph's or what, what would you want in your pinata? And finally, what is your spirit animal? Uh, Probably the three best, uh, questions that that Jess came up with especially the cheese party one uh and if you want to chime in our twitter is at pit lane parlay p-a-r-l-e-y and tell us what you would do with a 400 pound block of cheese uh i don't really know outside of jess's melted into a pool and have a queso dip party um but i digress Anyway, Jess, is there anything you wanted to, uh, you know, wrap up with? I just want to say thank you one more time for Joseph. That was uh, so much fun getting to talk with you. And thank you for taking my really random questions and just running with them. <laughs> um, I appreciate the uh, the thought you put into some of them, too. That's great. Um, and, yeah, I, I am super glad that we got that opportunity. And, and yeah, let us know what you would do with the block of cheese because I can't wait to see these answers. I mean, I'm sure it's going to get creative. Yeah, and uh, thank you to everybody that listened. And, uh, again, you know, thank you to Joseph. It's uh, you know, a pretty cool thing to be able to say that, you know, the show's first uh, IndyCar guest was none other than the series champion last year. Um, and with that, Jess, I'll let you sign it off. And remember, guys, keep your lug nuts tight.
I like cheese. I like cheese. Did say I like cheese, Christy. I like cheese. More, more, more. I like cheese. Say it more, more, more. I like cheese. More, more, more. I like cheese. 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 I like cheese.